If you don't mind, just stand to your feet because big cross is big. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. Hey. Thank you. Oh no, as you were. Howdy. Oh, come on. I'm back home in East Texas. Howdy. Howdy. Now we're talking. Wow. You guys are wonderful. It, it is so good to be back behind the pine curtain again. Where my chances of being hit by a hurricane are hovering near 0% for once in a very long time. Well, well, well. You guys are phenomenal. Uh, look, I'm so excited. Look, not, not only am I back home in East Texas, but we're literally in a place called Brisket Love. How's that food, everybody? This place is phenomenal, and, and the hosts are great. I'd like to ask you to do me a favor and put your hands together for the organizers of the event, Christina and Chris. You guys have done a phenomenal job of pulling this together. You guys mind if I ditch this? Otherwise, I'm going to like hold it up in the middle and kind of go around Freddie Mercury style, and no one needs to see that. There you go, dear. That was the first queen joke of the night. All right, so <clears throat> now that we're kicked off really good, everybody's got their bellies full. We've been able to do some applause. We've celebrated the people who organized this. I want to ask you guys a question. And I will tell you that since August 24th, 1996, I have crisscrossed Texas asking some form of this question. And the answer has kept me going all these years. Do you want me to ask you the question? Yes. Okay. It's not rhetorical. I'm not asking this question to hear myself ask a question. When I ask it, you're going to tell me how you really feel, aren't you? Yes. Okay. I heard some hesitancy. Some people worried about what that question may be. I'm not going to ask to see your vaccine passport. <laughs> you ain't going to see it anyway. <laughs> Let me just say, that horse paste does not taste like apple. I don't care what the label says. So let me ask the question. Are you ready for it? Yes. Who in this room tonight is ready for Texit? Yes. Cool, me too. <laughs> no, you know, it's amazing to me that no matter where we have gone, and I'm not talking about T&M events. I'm talking to traditional establishment, political organizations and civic organizations, any kind of organization you can think of, and ask that question, that's the response we get. And you know what's awesome about what just happened? The political establishment says you don't exist. They say you don't exist. Lost them in a boating accident too, did you? <laughs> they say that we don't exist. As a matter of fact, they treat us like we don't exist. And you know, I gotta say this, I'm fine with that. I love being underestimated. I, I will tell you, August 24th, 1996, when yours truly crossed that proverbial line in the sand, to begin to fight for Texas independence, you couldn't find other Texas independent supporters with a hunting dog and a Ouija board. It was tough. But I'm gonna tell you something. When you would sit down and have legitimate, real, substantive conversations with fellow Texans, they were all in. The question wasn't whether they wanted it, the question was whether or not we could make it happen. You see, the growth of Texit over all those years 
has been about building the confidence of our people that we could be a free, independent, self-governing nation among nations. When we could spin that globe around and put our finger on any land mass and go, those people have the right of self-government, why can't we? Thank you, that was unnecessary, but appreciated. But it's true. I mean, I want you to think about it. Right now, as it stands, there are almost 200 self-governing independent nations around the world whose laws begin and end in their borders. They are not governed by some outside bureaucracy. They have the right to govern themselves. When they make a decision about immigration, it sticks. When they make a decision about their borders, it sticks. When they make a decision about their monetary policy or their military or anything else, it sticks. But yet here we are in Texas, the ninth the largest economy in the world, top ranked in almost every single solitary category when compared with other nations around the world. And yet, if we agree to something here in Texas, it can be overridden at the stroke of a pen by a president potato head or a dysfunctional Congress based in the House of Reprehensibles or an unelected, unaccountable federal judiciary, or two and a half million unelected bureaucrats that are really the ones that are in charge of everything. Now, I don't know about you. Well, maybe I kind of do after that last answer when I ask the question. But I, I can tell you the Texans are not only smart enough we are strong enough and capable enough to govern ourselves That's right. without interference from those people who can't even seem to deliver bottled water after a hurricane. Okay, we have some anti-hurricane people in here. That makes me happy. Solidarity is nice. I see some of you have also had some experience with FEMA as well. But we can. But before I talk about where we've got to go, I want to talk a little bit about how we got here. Because I will say, you guys heard me make that, uh, give you that date, August 24th, 1996. You know, you hear, you hear people when they're saved talk about their come to Jesus moment. That was my come to Texas moment. You see, I'm a sixth generation Texan. My first ancestor on the soil of this place fought at the Battle of San Jacinto, showed up to reinforce the Alamo, got held up in Gonzales, and then burned everything in front of Santa Ana's army all the way through to the runaway scrape, where a band of volunteers, non-professional army types that had the rifles that they brought and the supplies they brought and the, what they could forge off the land, defeated the Napoleon of the West and made Texas a free, independent, self-governing nation state. That's my roots. At least on one side. On the other side, we're Greek, which means we like symmetry and grape leaves. I don't understand. Makes Thanksgiving real interesting at the house. But that being said, when I, was, when I was born, I was born to an unwed mother, 17 years old. And thank God Almighty, I was taken in by her parents. I was raised by a generation that did not raise most of my peers. And we were very blue collar. My father was an iron worker for 35 years until he retired in 1980. Mom was a secretary for most of the time that I knew. We were very blue collar. 
We always had enough to get by, but never enough to get ahead. And I will say this. I learned a lot about the federal government from watching how they treated working people like my parents. Watching how my dad, who was a Korean War vet, was treated like livestock by a government that said, serve in the military and we got your back. And watching how he was treated. Or watching how the Internal Revenue Service, I know we probably don't have any fans of those guys here. <laughs> watching how they treated my very working class and just barely above the poverty line family. But you know, the one thing that my folks never did was they never got, gave up hope. They, it, they were never bitter. They were tough, but they were never bitter. Every election cycle, the folks would go out and they'd find some candidate to back and they'd go put out campaign signs because this guy promised to make things better. And I can remember time after time after time watching my parents disappointed in their choice. Because it seems that when we send people, especially to Washington, D.C., they get infected by Washington, D.C. Some might even call it swamp fever. We send folks that make all these promises about how they're going to make the federal government better, and it never seems to get better, does it? So as I graduated from high school, I did what, folk, what, what I learned to do, which was go out and try to fix that system by finding other people or trying to hold those federal politicians accountable. And it was always federal, federal, federal. And no matter what I did, it seemed that nothing made a difference. And I came to the growing realization my early 20s, wow, right? I came to a growing realization that here in Texas, we could get everything 100% right. We could have a unanimous vote on any policy. We could make whatever decisions that we wanted to make here, which trend, let's be honest, toward those of liberty and freedom, right, in comparison to places like California and New York. We could, we could be 100% on the same page. We could send 100% of our congressional representatives to Washington, D.C., and they could all vote right in lockstep. But at the end of the day, whatever we decide didn't stick. It wouldn't stick because it could be overridden by any of those people that I mentioned. And, man, you want to talk about having somebody take the jam out of your donut. That is a terrible realization. Because while we could work to fix Texas, we're not going to fix California. Are we? No. Are we going to fix New York? No. no. But we can fix Texas. So August 24th, 1996, the choice was presented to me, Texas as an independent nation. Daniel Miller, are you in or are you out? I was in, and I've been in ever since. Because, you know, we talked a moment ago about my ancestor who went to reinforce the Alamo. You guys remember that super famous letter, right? That everyone recites, the Travis letter from the Alamo. What, what are the words that he signed at the bottom? What did he say after his name? What did he say? He said, victory or death. You know what that means? Win or die. Or keep fighting until you do win. So August 24, 1996, I made that decision to fight for Texas independence, to see our people as free, independent, self-governing as a nation among nations, victory or 
until the grave digger was patting me in the face with a shovel. Whichever came first. I will tell you right now, I do believe now that I'm going to see it. Don't, don't clap for me because we're not there yet, but doggone it, we're getting there. And it's not because of what I do, it's because of what you do. Because this is not about me. It's never been about me. It's about us. You see, I had been introduced to the Texas Constitution at that moment, and I never knew what it said. I mean, think about it, right? We go through high school. I mean, it was to, I mean, we all took Texas history if you went to high school here, right? We took Texas history, took a government class. We might have spent five minutes on Texas government, never read the Texas Constitution. And granted, it's pretty unwieldy. So it wasn't until August 24th, 1996 that I, I read the Texas Bill of Rights, the very beginning of the Texas Constitution. Do you know what the first words of the Texas Constitution are? It says Texas is a free and independent state. Those are the first words. And it goes on to say that the perpetuity of the union depends on the right of local self-government unimpaired to all the states. I mean, I want you to think about this. In baked in our governing document is the phrase that tells us what we got to do. It says the perpetuity of the union, AKA our continued membership and participation in the union depends on what? The right of local self-government unimpaired. Folks, let me ask you a question. Do you feel like our right of self-government has been impaired? Yes. Do you feel like you are governing yourself right now or being governed by a bunch of bureaucrats? Yes. Well, guess what? The Texas Constitution that we live under right now, that every elected official has to put their hand up in the air and swear an oath to protect, tells us that the union between Texas and the other 49 is over. It's over. It's not the way we wanted it. It's not the way that we wanted it. When Texas entered into the union, we believed that it was going to be a very limited union where we agreed to trade with one another states, where we agreed to defend one another, we agreed to deliver mail between the states, right? Very limited. And instead, for generations now, what we've got is encroachment after encroachment after encroachment, not only on our right of self-government, but almost every other right guaranteed to us through the Bill of Rights. Think about it. Think about when's the last time, if any, that you've woken up in the morning and not had to be concerned about which right is being trampled on by the federal government today. When? Because they have systematically eroded crumbled and destroyed as many as possible because they get a chance to interpret what those rights are. Hence, people losing their guns in boating accidents. But now we're at a critical point. We're at a critical stage. Because no longer are the encroachments small. No longer is their work silent. No longer are they practicing incrementalism. Now you have a head of state who gets on national TV and literally says that they're going after the governors of the states that don't comply. 
Not my words. His. And the full force of the federal government behind him. You know, it's amazing because we think we got a bunch of good guys. Well, some of us do. Think we got a bunch of good guys here in Austin that are going to stand up and stand between us and the federal government. But where were they when the order came from the federal government that we had to slap a piece of cloth across our face and you couldn't go to church on Sunday? They complied. Some of the greatest capitulations since Neville Chamberlain came back with his hat in hand after his meeting with Hitler and said, oh, I've achieved peace in our time. <laughs> so we got a choice to make, folks. You know, before we might have had the luxury of maybe toe dipping a little bit. Oh, you know, I don't know if that Independence water is warm enough for me. Oh, maybe it's a little cold. Oh, maybe it's a little too hot. We don't have that luxury anymore. The moment of decision is upon us. We are being called, this generation that lives right now, we are being called to service. Much like my ancestor that came here was called to reinforce the Alamo and join the Texian army and defeat the Napoleon of the West, we are being called. We can't shuffle this off to the next generation. We can't kick the can down the road. This is on us. This day, at this time. And as Texans, we have to make a clear decision about where we stand. Yeah, independence is pragmatic, right? You know, we can talk about how much the federal government screws us over economically. Right? I could stand up here and talk about, oh, well, you guys do realize that we overpay anywhere from 103 to $160 billion annually into the federal system. Right? We could talk about that, how they're stealing from us. We could talk about how federal regulatory excess compresses GDP by 2% annually, and that robs us of about 85% of our take-home pay. We could talk about that. We could talk about the federal debt. We could talk about the, I mean, we could literally talk about the, the whole issue with the Afghanistan withdrawal and how much Texas blood was laid in the sand to see us tuck our tail between our legs and pull out in that, uh, uh, I, I can't, that abomination. How many lives were sacrificed for that to be the end? We can talk about all those. We can talk about all the pragmatic reasons, but what I want to talk to you about tonight is really what I think Thomas Jefferson referred to as first principles. Our right to govern ourselves, to worship according to the dictates of our conscience, to be able to keep and bear arms in defense of ourselves and our neighbors not against rabid deer, but against government tyranny. Yeah. Ryan, I'm getting wound up. Can you feel it? That's going to happen. I didn't even bring my sweat rag. That's fine. If you guys start throwing paper towels at me, I'm leaving, though. Just say it. But what we need to talk about is the decision that we've got to make, right? Because even if we squared all those things away, right, suddenly we were no longer overpaying into the union and they started repealing federal regulations and things of that nature, which we know they're not. At the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we better off in or are we better off out? And more importantly, we have to ask ourselves, what really matters to us? What matters? What are our principles? What do we stand on? What do we believe? Because understand something. Knowing what the vast majority of Texans believe 
We are not going to be able to coexist in a political, a cultural, and economic union with states that have diametrically opposed worldviews. Now, the good news for us, this moment of decision, this moment in history, is we have an option. Also laid out in that very same Texas Constitution. I love these words. Article 1, Section 2 of the Texas Constitution says this. All political power is inherent in the people. That's awesome. I'm not sure whether you're applauding for the people or the power or the fact that I could remember that, but <laughs> it works. Why don't you think about those words? If Article 1, Section 1 declares us a free and independent state and says that we have to bust out of here at the moment our right of self-government has been infringed, in the very next statement says that all political power is inherent in the people. All political power is inherent in who? The people. Guys, that didn't sound very powerful. Let's try that again. All political power is inherent in who? The and who are we? The people. We're the people, right? Notice that it did not say that all political power is inherent in the politicians or the pollsters or the pundits, or the propagandists masquerading as journalists. It says that all political power is inherent in the people. So ultimately, the decision on how we govern ourselves, whether in or out of the union or anything in between, is on who? The people. Which is a great responsibility. You know, I firmly believe that those that are opposed to Texas are afraid of the self part of self-government. They are incapable of the, of the internal and self-discipline necessary to govern themselves and are afraid of what they might do if that power was put into their hands. But my message to them is simple, tough, get over it. Because you are incapable of governing yourself does not mean I want to shuck my right of self-government to some unelected bureaucrat who thinks they are smarter than me. I think I'm in the right room. I think I'm in the right room. But Article 1, Section 2 goes on to say this. Not only does it say that all political power is inherent in the people, but it says the people have, at all times, the inalienable right to alter, reform, or abolish their government in such manner as they may think expedient. Guys, I, I didn't write that. I straight up plagiarized it right out of the Texas Constitution. Just want you to be aware. Full disclaimers. Not from my pen. But you know what's impressive about Article 1, Section 2 is that it has existed in almost every Texas Constitution all the way back to the Republic of Texas Constitution in 1836. It is so Jeffersonian in principles in its wording, its language, its ideas, but it's not really just Jeffersonian. It's at its very core, the identity of what it means to be Texan. It is who we are. Our right of self-government is baked into our DNA. Because, you know, I mentioned a moment ago that letter that Travis wrote, the famous one, the victory or death letter, they call it. Most people don't realize that Colonel Travis wrote many letters from the Alamo and sent them out via dispatch riders. 
And one that he wrote to Jesse Grimes, who Jesse Grimes was not there at the Alamo, obviously, because he sent the letter, but Jesse Grimes was watching Travis's son. He had custody of him while Travis was at the garrison at the Alamo. And so many of those letters were written to Jesse Grimes. And he was very clear in one of those letters about why those people in the Alamo fought for victory to their very last breath. Now, some of those people that are shucking that critical race theory crap will tell you that it's about slavery. I could tell you that Colonel Travis didn't mention slavery not one time. Some will say that it was over land and that they were a bunch of racists and hated Mexican people, and that's not true either. Because there were Tejanos inside that mission that spilled their blood for us too. But he was clear. And this is what he said. He said, let the convention therefore go on and make a declaration of independence. He said, for if they do not, my men will lay down their arms and surrender. But if they do, if the convention declares independence, my men will peril their lives a thousand times. Under the flag of independence, my men will peril their lives a thousand times. It's baked into our DNA. We are an independent people. We love self-government and we jealously guard our rights. And we are now, my friends, at an impasse. For us to uphold those principles that we hold dear, we must take that step and become a self-governing nation among nations to take control of our own destiny, to put the self back in self-government. So, this is where we are, this crossroads, this two paths diverging in the woods. Understand that if we do nothing, then the other side wins. Future generations will grow up not knowing Texas as we have known it. Known it. They will be taught in our schools that the Alamo was fought over slavery and racism. They will tear down our monuments. They will, make, they will turn and convert every right we have into a permission. Your very ability to think, to speak, and to act will be buffered on every side by a politically correct, neo-Marxist driven federal system. And if you don't believe me, turn on the news. Yeah. Or listen to me. But that would be a little narcissistic if I'd have said that, right? I'm not going to say that. Got to have third party backup. Well, we're, we're going to have us a QA, <laughs> but it ain't going to be right now. But I appreciate your passion and enthusiasm. Oh, it's not, it's not a sermon. I'm not wearing my bow tie. That's okay. I'll break out the bow tie. We can sermonize later. I'll invite you out to the prayer meeting. All right. So we understand that there is no status quo. It's one way or the other. That's the way of the world. And that's where we're being called in this generation to make a choice. Much like... Travis drew his line in the sand and asked the Alamo defenders to make a choice. We are being called to make that choice. And frankly, folks, I'm going to tell you, I think the people of Texas have already chosen. We just haven't done it at the ballot box yet. Am I right? Thank you very much. You are absolutely adorable. I got a front row, I got a front row cheerleader. You guys are being outclassed over here. 
So the question becomes, where are we at now and how do we get to independence? Because I'm going to tell you, I love being this close, but close doesn't count. Close is not going to cut it. It's all about the win. It's all about making sure we get this thing across the goal line and publish a W. It's all about being able to celebrate a brand new Texas Independence Day. Why do I say we're closer than we've ever been? Because we are. You guys have to understand. I mentioned what it was like 25 years ago, but let me tell you what it was like just in 2005. All the poll numbers that existed, all the polling for this issue showed Texas independence polling in single digits of support. Single digits. The good news is we have always polled higher than the approval rating of the United States Congress. <laughs> Those guys generally poll somewhere like above or below that of leprosy, right? Dep depending on the week. But we've always polled higher. But you know what? Single digits was something. But in 2005, from 2005 to 2009, we crisscrossed Texas talking to people, asking them the form of the question that I asked you at the very beginning. And what we found was not reflective of those poll numbers. We found a people that were concerned about the direction of the federal government and were ready for Texas to do something about it and they did not know anything could be done. 2009 happened. Rick Perry made a statement. Somebody shouted the word secede at a, at a rally that Rick Perry was at and the media jammed a microphone in his face, expected him to crawfish. He said, what, 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 what do you, Governor, what, what do you think about that statement? And his response, well, if the federal government keeps thumbing their nose at Texas, who knows what might come of that? Not the answer they were expecting. So it got polled again. Research 2000 poll in 2009. They thought, ah, we got old Rick Perry now. We're going we're to talk about how extreme and fringe this idea is, and we're going to time to it. They did the poll. 50% of Republicans, 45% of independent voters, and 15% of Democrats said, yeah, I think Texas would be better off as an independent nation. <laughs> wow. Those were impressive. Jaws hit the floor. My feet hit the street again because we had to go meet those people. 2014 rolls around, Scottish independence referendum. Yet again, they come knocking on our door. Well, let's poll Texas independent. Let's poll the Texans and see what they think, right? Anytime independence comes out around the world, they won't come talk to us. So 2014, Reuters Ipsos poll comes out, ask the hard question. Do you think your state should withdraw from the union and become an independent country? Wow, you know what that is? That's a question of political will. It's not fantasy football. Well, do you think your state would be better off? That's fantasy football. What this is, is the real question. The results blew everybody out of the box. 54% of Texas Republicans, half of independent voters, and 35% of Democrats said, let's absolutely get out of here. Now, I want you to think about those numbers for a second. Think about those numbers. Those numbers not only were higher overall in the electorate than people who wanted to stay, they were almost 12 to 16 percentage points higher than those who wanted to stay. With those numbers over the electoral numbers, the way Texans vote, we could have won a referendum held that day in 2014. But remember, we don't exist. We don't exist. So we worked hard, tried to get someone to file the legislation to give Texans a vote on the issue, an in or out vote. And finally this session, I thank God every day for State Representative Kyle Biederman
because Biederman had the fortitude to file House Bill 1359, which would have ultimately given us a vote to kickstart the process of withdrawal. And man, oh man, knives out. The media came for him, his legislative colleagues came for him, and they thought they would isolate him and make him alone. But man, oh man, were they ever wrong. Because all of a sudden, James White, chairman of the Homeland Security Committee in the Texas legislature, marched right down the clerk's office and put his name right next to Kyle's. He said, I'm in. And man, oh man, you want to talk about what really upset them? James not a white guy. He shattered their narrative that this was about racism. He destroyed it. And then you had guys like Steve Toth, Jeff Kaysen, Brian Slayton, Phil Stevenson, all marched down to that clerk's office and put their name on that bill because they said at a minimum, the people of Texas deserve a vote on independence. They believed in us and our ability to make our own choices. And the political establishment lined up against it, right out of the governor's office. This bill is not to see the light of day. And all of his yes men, like Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, or as I like to call him, Silent Sam, backed away, kept his mouth shut, and obeyed orders. Chairman, excuse me, Speaker of the House, Dave Phelan, couldn't leave Dave out because that guy happens to be my state rep, made sure that that bill never saw the light of day and he used one of his lieutenants from up in this area to make it happen. You see, State Representative Chris Patty from over there in Marshall is the chairman of the State Affairs Committee where that bill was assigned to. Now this is the same Chris Patty who just got censured by the Harrison County Republican Party because he is so much of a squish. He does not listen to his constituents. And guess what? He's going to pay a price at the ballot box. He's going to pay a price. But the Capitol was inundated with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of phone calls and visits from people like you that they said did not exist, saying all we want is the right to vote on this issue. And you know what they said? Sorry guys, you're too stupid to make your own decisions, but all of us smart guys up here in Austin will make that decision for you and the decision we made is no. That's what they did. And we have to look at it that way because that is exactly what they did. There's no soft peddling. There's no candy coating. Look, I'm back home in East Texas. I know you guys don't like the sugar coating on stuff, do you? You want it all straight, no chaser, don't you? Well, that's what you're gonna get tonight. Because the pure, unadulterated truth is that the vast majority of your elected officials in Austin, Texas had nothing but contempt and derision for you. The hardworking, God-fearing people of Texas were spit on and treated like trash by those elected officials in Austin. And you know what? I'm sick and tired of it. I don't know if you're sick and tired of it, but I'm over it. I'm fed up with the electorate of Texas being treated like they're a bunch of idiots where these guys can go in during election season and make a bunch of promises and then go up there and treat us like garbage. All to placate their federal masters. I'm gonna tell you something, little known stat. 86 legislative session, almost half of the bills filed mentioned the federal government in some way. Whether it was a federal agency, a federal law, a federal regulation, federal money, whatever it was, almost half of the bills filed. You know what that means? That means that the two and a half million unelected bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. are telling us what bills we can pass. And you know who's, uh, you know who's allowing that to happen? Our elected officials in Austin. 
Thank God for Biederman and all of those good guys up there that are fighting against it that say, you know what, regardless of what is, is popular or what the political establishment says, they will 100% stand with us, the people of Texas. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Yeah. <laughs> but we got a little ways to go. Because they shut us down in committee and we embarrassed them with a virtual committee hearing that exposed every lie they told, every excuse that they used to keep you from even testifying on that bill. We absolutely obliterated them in a press conference there in the Capitol, standing shoulder to shoulder with those state representatives who signed on to our legislation. I made it known that the people of Texas were tired of this and were not taking it anymore. Before this bill was ever filed, I made a promise I told the legislators that the only litmus test was whether or not they signed on to this piece of legislation. That was the only thing we were going to care about, and every one of them that did not could face a challenger in the next election cycle. The message was clear. You either give us a referendum on Texas independence in 2021, or we will have a referendum on you on 2022. They think they're calling our bluff. They have bit off more than they could chew. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, they have miscalculated and overplayed their hand because the people that support Texas have been exposed and shown in that virtual committee hearing. The first, let, let me just give you a couple little stats. We invited people to submit video testimony just like it was a committee hearing. Less than three minutes, had to say the certain things about the bill that they supported it, didn't support it, whatever it was. All of that testimony that was collected over six days of video, we had people a six day window. Had that been an actual committee hearing, it would have been, 1359 would have been the most testified bill in legislative history. Strung together back to back to back, the testimony from front to back ran over 24 hours. The youngest person to testify was 14 years old. His name was Yona Ramos, a Hispanic Jewish boy from San Antonio. Someone who said they don't, doesn't exist. One of the most brilliant pieces of testimony was a less than three minute takedown over the objection that this is unconstitutional and illegal by a high school sophomore. We had testimony from veterans from every armed conflict since World War II. Every branch represented. We had doctors. We had nurses. We had teachers both at the the primary school, high school level, up to, uh, up to collegiate level, professors, business owners, short order cooks, fast food workers, every profession you could imagine, blue collar, white collar. It was truly a cross section of Texas. It ticked off every box that they said did not exist in support for Texas. Everyone, we as a people, Texas supporters are more representative of Texas than either major political party. You know what that means? That means that we're gonna win. So let, let me ask y'all a question. Y'all want, want to hear him or what you want to do? Because, okay. Cause, yeah, okay. I, I'll tell you like I tell other people. Pound sand, pal. See you at the ballot box.
This ain't about me. You know what? I didn't offer testimony. <laughs> I just gave the press conference. Because that was the next logical step. We made the promise that we were going to challenge them all. And we started recruiting candidates. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are some of you sitting in this room right now. I know of one person right now that answered that call. And that's Mr. Charles Turner right here. Charles, stand up. Charles answered the call because the fact of the matter is if they don't represent us, they cannot represent us. And we have to have people that are pro texit that take seats in Austin if we're going to win the day. Amen. Proof positive. If you want to you learn a lesson from what happened in Brexit, Brexit and the length of time it took was absolute proof that you better have the right people in government when you have the vote or you're not going to get a good deal when you leave. And Charles, I'm so glad you answered the call and stepped up. And I know that there's some people in this room right now, I know they're not going to let you stand alone up here in East Texas. I know they're either going to work with you to help get you elected or you are going to run for office because these people did not go to Austin and represent you. But you see, it's not enough for us to run a bunch of candidates. You guys all were treated to the petition when you walked in. <clears throat> that petition campaign has never been successfully done in Texas history. A very narrow window in the Texas election code allows us with the collection of enough signatures to force the question on the primary ballot. Texas Election Code 172.088 says if we collect the requisite signatures, which is around 80,000, then they are forced by law to put our question on the ballot. Which means next spring, you could go into the ballot box and you could pull up your little ballot and you could scroll, 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 or paper if that's your choice be my choice and you'll see a question should the state of Texas reassert its status as an independent nation yes or no yes. we're going to give the people of Texas the choice that they did not get because the legislature shut it down we're putting it on the ballot, and not only that, we're putting candidates up and down from top to bottom that will carry out your will when you vote for Texas. This is what we're doing. This is the plan. And this is a once in a generation opportunity to flip over the chessboard, to take back our government in Austin, to secure our right of self-government, and become a self-governing, independent nation state once again. And it all comes down to right now. I believe the next several months are going to be pivotal in the history of Texas. We are writing the history right now. It's happening right now. And the question is, are you going to be a part of it? Are you going to be a part of it? Yes. Are you ready to make Texas a reality? Well, then here's what we got to do. It's everyone. It's all hands on deck. Everyone has got to participate. There can be no spectators. We all have to do our part, whatever that part is. We all have to grab a piece of this effort and make it work and get us across the finish line. Because we know what the alternative is. If we don't win here, we lose it all. High risk, high reward, but a steep price for failure. So we absolutely must win. And I know with all of you, we can make it win. We can make this the moment that is written about in history books for generations to come. 
that says that the people of Texas at this pivotal time in history stood up for what they believed in and they won the day. Remember, we talk a lot about the Alamo, but let us never forget San Jacinto. Let us never forget that there is victory over, over overwhelming odds. And folks, you heard the poll numbers. The odds are not overwhelming. The federal government makes our case every day. We simply just have to get it to a vote. But for those of you that are on the fence still, that are not committed, that have 14 dozen questions because I was the same way, we can talk about those in the Q&A. If you've got very specific questions, we've got all that on the website. And I can answer some of those too, time permitting. But I want to just boil it down to this final question that I'm going to ask you. It's the one that flips the whole debate on its head. <clears throat> if this was not about Texas, if this was not about Texas independence tonight, but instead the reverse, let's play that scenario out. Let us all imagine for a moment that we are currently standing in the free, independent, self-governing, sovereign Republic of Texas. It's where we're at tonight. You guys with me? Yes. We are self-governing in every respect. We have control over our own borders and immigration. We have control over our own monetary policy and our military. We have our own embassies and passports. There is one flag flying over the Capitol building in Austin. We even have our own Olympic team. It's a thing. But imagine. Imagine that for a moment. And instead of having this debate over Texas, we were having a debate over whether or not we should join the union. Spoilers. So let me ask you the question. Knowing everything you know about the federal government right now, all of the situation and the imbalance, everything you know right now, would you vote to join the union? Yes. No. 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 So, somebody left a hanging chat on their ballot back there. <laughs> Sorry, there's no taxi backsies. So you wouldn't vote to join the union, right? No. Well, then let me ask you a question. If you wouldn't vote to join, then why would you ever vote to stay? And that is the question that we have to put to the people of Texas. We can make our case. The opposition cannot. So before I hand this back over to Ms. Armour, who's going to come up here for a couple minutes, and then I'll come up here for some, more, for some questions, uh, and a fair warning on the questions. Sorry that gentleman didn't stay to hear this warning. But the more belligerent your questions are, the more belligerent my answers can be. Fair is fair, right? Tax it. That wasn't belligerent. That just made me happy. But I'll say this, and I'm going to leave you with the words of Sam Houston. It was Sam Houston who, after Texas joined the Union, said this. He said that Texas will again lift its head and stand among the nations. My friends, that time is now, and from me to you, I am proud to be standing with you. I want to thank you all for your indulgence tonight. I have to get a drink. Thank you all.